Okay, folks, the Word of God is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow is a critic of the thoughts and intents of the heart. All Scripture is God-breathed, is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be mature, thoroughly furnished into all good works. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And let me just say before we get before we get started, and I'll explain it later on. This morning, this whole morning has been a disaster uh, with my computer, with my iPad, um, Zoom meeting, and this is why it's absolutely imperative that we start this stuff early because of what might take place. None of this was due to my fault. But it's just, the, it just like, uh, here's one test right after another, and today's message is going to be just right for all of us, including me. Um, so let's take just a moment of time to prepare ourselves for the study of God's Word through the technique of rebound and operation cry if necessary. And, okay, somebody's got their, let me see who it is. Somebody's got their microphone. It's me. Okay. I don't know how, I don't know how to turn it off. Okay, just, um, okay, uh, go down to the bottom of your screen, touch the bottom of your screen, and your microphone will be on. You can just, uh, just touch your microphone. Okay. Okay, folks, uh, that's okay. Let's move on from here. Uh, heads bowed and eyes closed, you make your own way with the Lord through the confession of your own personal sins. Now close out our prayer time. Father, it's a great opportunity to rejoice in all things. And you know, I've, got, I've been thinking about this, Father, for uh, some time. And we're not really going to rejoice about the fact, oh my goodness, Lord, get, uh, make something bad happen so I can rejoice. No, Father, we realize these things are in your control. And when they occur, we are to rejoice in all things. I thank you, Father, for the privilege of being able to identify or to, to uh, uh, really give a meaning to this idea of rejoicing. And this, this message this morning, Father, it just be. How about this word, Father? Fantasticer. No, that's not a real word, but we know what we mean. It's just fantasticer than the day before. More fantastic. So anyway, Father, let us get into the study. May the Holy Spirit guide us in the meaning of all this. There is so much to learn here, and it's more than just reading something. It's more than just uh, listening to something. Father, it's internalizing this information because as bad as things are, they're going to get worse. And how about worser? Yes, uh, worser. It, it's just going to get so bad, Father, that it, without your word, there's no, there's no hope for us. There's no help. But I'm grateful for every person that's logged on with me this morning because they are on the right road. We are on the right road, depending on where we are in terms of our own understanding, our own spiritual growth, wherever we happen to be. There's going to be another minute. There's going to be another hour, another day, another month to, to advance to where the, we need to get to. And that's the goal of spiritual maturity. Take this lesson today, Father, and honor yourself with this message because it's your word. And I'm just praying that the Spirit of God will, uh, will guide me in my words in order to be able to identify your plan and how it is to be lived out in our life. In Christ's name, amen. All right, let me, um, here it is. It's uh, Philippians 4.4 4 and 4.5. And uh, this coming uh, next week is when we will be back at American Pie Pizza in, uh, in North Little Rock. The same local. Location, same time, same place, different message. Okay, let's move on now to our uh, to our uh, our study, and I want to bring my passage up here, and this begin right at the right at the top by way of a brief review. And here's where we're going. Please, please, please give attention to this. In Philippians four one through four. Therefore, Paul said, based on what I said in chapter three, verses 17 to the end of the chapter, what he said there 
is the basis for what he's going to say here. He said, therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, he's speaking to born again believers in Philippi, but he's also addressing you and me, you and I, as born again Christians in this period of human history. Therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, whom I long to see, my joy and my crown. Well, you reach spiritual maturity, you're going to be my crown. That's one of the crowns that I receive when I get to the beam seat. You reach spiritual maturity, you become a crown. You are my joy. Why in the world do I put up with all this stuff? Why in the world do I spend hours in a day studying uh, here, there, someplace else, studying this word? I'm Listen, this is my food. I eat this. This is my nourishment. This is my love. This is my passion. And he says, stand firm. What that means, wherever you happen to be in your spiritual growth, don't you go backwards. Don't you get distracted. Don't you allow yourself to go backwards, get into reversionism, uh, get out of fellowship with God. No, stand firm. Plant your feet in cement. You get inside the sphere of the Spirit, you stay there. Well, you have to know how to do that. But he says, stand firm in the Lord. See, you're born again. You can't do this outside the Lord. So stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. And this way, he'd already told us back in seven, verses 17 through 21 of the previous chapter. He goes on in verse 2. While he's telling the people in, in Philippi to stand firm, he said, look, you got a problem there. He said, you got these two wonderful ladies, Euodia and Syntyche. And they, they've got a, they got a problem with one another. And by the way, they've served me. They've been, oh, they've just done, just fantastic. They've helped me. They've, whatever I wanted them to do, here they are, they're doing it. But they've got a problem. They've got a problem with each other. So he said, I'm urging Sintichi and Euodia to live in harmony. That means get back in fellowship with God. That means get back inside the sphere of the spirit. Start living again from your new woman. Now, Philippians 4.3, he's going to urge a group of people to help put that problem back together. Well, they can't put it back together, but they're going to encourage Euodia and Syntyche to live in harmony. So he calls out some people for some help. He said, indeed, true companion, we don't know who that is. I also, I ask you also, help these women. True companion, you help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel. Yeah, Paul struggled in the gospel every time he opened his mouth. Someone was there to put him in jail, beat him, you know, whatever, uh, to be to put pressure on him, to silence him. So he said, these, these women actually help uh, share my struggle in the cause of the gospel, and that's what you're doing. You're helping me. He said, together with Clement, that's another person. We don't know who that is, as well as the rest of my fellow workers. We don't know who those were. Speculation, yes, but we don't know specifically who they were, whose names are in the book of life. In other words, the indication here is they are saved, but again, I mentioned the fact that every human being's name is in the book of life until you die, and if you die and you're saved, guess what? It stays there. If you die and you're not saved, your name is removed from the book. These people here are truly saved and the omniscience of God and Paul understood this. In Philippians 4.4, 4, this is the verse. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Now, let me point, point something out here. I've talked to you in times past about the uh, many pa pastors in general. And I have been guilty of this. I don't want to be guilty of it anymore. And that is telling you what to do without the how to do it. This passage this morning, when you take a look at this thing, this phrase, and it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And you realize, listen, don't, don't try to take that word always and make it, make it mean something other than what it really means. This means 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year, until you die or until the rapture. And knowing that God is in control of every circumstance of life, you know that from one minute to the next, you have a good circumstance, then you got a bad one, then you got one that's even worse, then you got one that's getting better, but you got this thing over here again that's just blown completely out of the water. 
And Paul is telling us to rejoice in the Lord always. And I can tell you for a fact that it's very possible that you're sitting here listening to me and listening to what Paul has written, you're seeing what Paul has written, and you think, oh my goodness, this is wonderful. These are wonderful words from God. But the truth of the matter is, it's either going in one ear and straight out the other, because, and as demonstrated by your moment-by-moment -moment lifestyle. I'm not criticizing you. I'm not maligning you. I'm not badgering you. I am, I am passionate. I am brokenhearted. For people who don't see this, it's not a matter of coming to Bible class, being regular in Bible class. It's not, it's not just a matter of listening to what has been said, going to, going to quote unquote church, going to Sunday school, listening, fellowshipping. Oh, great time. No, listen, the world is falling apart. And until you have the capacity to rejoice in all things, and Paul says, let me emphasize this, rejoice in the Lord always, and again, I say rejoice. Now, I've been, been bothered by this phrase for a number of weeks now, knowing that this was coming up. And I've prayed, I've asked God, please give me some way of explaining this, that we'll know what it means to rejoice. Because to me, Rejoicing is not just say, okay, I got this bad thing, so let me just grab the flag and run down the, run down the aisle with it, get on my face and cry out to God, uh, screaming and crying and moaning and groaning and beating my chest. No, listen, hallelujah, praise God. No, this is not what this is. Rejoicing, and, and when I take a look at this, this statement that I have here, there are key words in here that if I broke this down, it would just make the lesson much longer, and I think we can get it this way. Rejoicing is what? The first thing rejoicing is, it is a regenerate Christian. <clears throat> now, what does that mean? I've got this idea, and we're going to talk about this, whether somebody is a true Christian or whether they're a false Christian. And let me just, I'm, I'm, I wrote this note to myself this morning. <clears throat> you see, <clears throat> When, you, when you're talking about Israelites, you can be an Israelite by, by birth. All you have to be is of the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and jo Jacob, and you are a Jew genetically. But as we read from the Apostle Paul, a, a Jew is, is not just a Jew, but there is a true Jew who is a regenerate Jew, who is a person who has the genes of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and has believed that Jesus is the Messiah of Israel. So you've got this group of Jews running around out here that are, uh, are Jews by, by birth. They're genetic Jews. But listen, they're not what God wants. God wants that genetic Jew to be a believer that Jesus is the Messiah. Now, if you can wrap your mind around this, that you've got these genetic Jews over here, born a Jew, and their life is worthless to God in terms of the plan of God for the Jews. You have to be a regenerate Jew. So while you've got this false Jew over here, and you've got this true Jew, we've got false Christians, people who claim to be a Christian, but they've never been born again. What's wrong? Well, they've been given a false gospel. They're trying to create their own, own plan to be saved and go to heaven. No, it doesn't work. It's not faith plus some form of works. That makes you a false Christian. That makes you a religious Christian, and you're going to hell. You're going to burn in the lake of fire for an eternity if, if at the time you die. That's your lot because you are a false Christian, and yet you call yourself Christians. There are millions of people today that call themselves Christians that are, that are going to burn in hell and spend an eternity separated from Almighty God because they don't know what it means to be a true Christian. A true Christian is like a true Jew, is a regenerate person. So the, when you're talking about rejoicing now, rejoicing is a regenerate Christian, that's you, that's me, that's us, who have believed that Jesus is the, is the um, 
uh, son of God. He died, he was buried, and resurrected three days later. You believe that, and you are a regenerate Christian. Now, rejoicing, then, is the regenerate Christian's favorable mental attitude. We as believers have a mental attitude about many things. But the question is, is your, is your, is your mental attitude favorable? And a favorable mental attitude meaning a mental attitude that is lining up with God's plan for whatever it is that you're considering at that moment in time. So rejoicing is a regenerate Christian's favorable mental attitude and a favorable emotional response. It's not a matter of being angry, bitter, resentful. No, holding a grudge. No, it's a favorable emotional response. Joy, peace. And about what? It's this favorable mental attitude, a favorable emotional response to of gratitude, of gratitude. That means you're grateful for something and you're grateful toward whatever, not this, not that, not your lawn, not your car, not, not your groceries, not your medical condition. No, no, it's, it's favorable, favorable, favorable mental attitude and emotional response of gratitude. Lord, I, I can't believe that you've done all this for me. I'm so grateful for all you've done toward God. And why, are you, why you have this grateful attitude? It's because of the abundance of grace provided by him. And I got to thinking about that. A, fav, a, a, the, a, a favorable response, an attitude, emotional response of this gratitude toward God for this abundance of grace. And I thought, you know, let, let's talk about this. Uh, has God provided me with an abundance of grace? Oh, yes, he has, folks. He's provided you. He's provided me. He's provided somebody else. But you see, we get so caught up in the, in the, uh, in the affairs of life that we hear this, this phrase, the abundance of grace, and oh yes, it's out there somewhere, but I, you know, and I, I really, I'm not sure what it is. And see, if you don't know what it is, how in the world can you be grateful? How can you have this response of gratitude toward God if you don't know what the mercies of God are? If you don't know what those responses are for you? What has he provided? The abundance of grace provided by him, by God the Father, who is the author of the plan, through Jesus Christ. Then it goes on to say, to the one who is rejoicing. In other words, uh, the, the one rejoicing is the one who's received this abundance. And watch this, the one who is rejoicing under every type of circumstance. This means the good, the bad, the right, the wrong, and the indifferent. <coughs> Many times, you cannot, you cannot create your own set of circumstances. God is the author of your circumstance. Jesus Christ is in control of human history. God knows exactly what you're going to do, what's going to happen in your life. He allows you, even as you reach spiritual maturity, he brings, how about this, Paul's thorn in the flesh. See, this is the angelic conflict. This is the angelic conflict. All of this is related to the angelic conflict. And it makes absolutely no sense. Sense. So when you look at your circumstances of life, and I will guarantee you, if I went down this list and called you by name, went down this list over here on uh, uh, on Facebook, and went down this list by by name, just calling your name, it is an absolute amazement to the kind of pressure that every one of us are under. There is a like a universal kind of pressure. Uh, gas prices are the same for you as they are for me. The price of groceries is the same. The weather is the same wherever you're located. The people in that locale are, are bearing the burden of the heat or the, uh, or the, by the way, my sister in Ohio, she has, she's got lung problems. And the smoke from Canada has been coming down there to where there are times when she can't even get outside. I was told today that it's as far down as 
as North Carolina. My sister had a phone call from some a friend in North Carolina. She said that smoke is clear down there. Fortunately, it hasn't come it hasn't come to Arkansas yet, but we have our own problems here. So the idea is to rejoice under all circumstances. Let me go back now and take a look at that. And sometime today, sometime this week, when you have time, you go back and look at that rejoicing again and see what my definition and description of rejoicing is. And you pull that apart and make an application to your life. Rejoicing is a regenerate Christian's favorable mental attitude. You might have a bad one. You got this circumstance. You're grumpy. You're griping. You're belly aching. You're complaining. You're groaning. You're moaning. You're worried. You're anxious. Is a regenerate, uh, regenerate Christian's favorable mental attitude and favorable emotional response of gratitude. See, the response from our mental attitude, the response from our emotion is gratitude toward God. Why? For the abundance of grace provided by him to you who is doing the rejoicing under every type of circumstance without regard to whether the circumstance is good or bad. Now probably I ought to just quit right here. But I can't and I don't want to. You see, Paul rejoiced. We saw that last week and Jesus rejoiced. Now it's our turn. It's your turn. It's my turn. And if I went down this list one more time and called everyone by name, not because I'm trying to be harmful, not trying to hurt, but it's to catch your attention that this is our Christian duty. Rejoice. And that word rejoice is a command and it means to keep on rejoicing. So if you were just rejoicing, you had this good mental attitude, you had this great emotional response of gratitude toward God because you're considering, you're thinking all day long about what he's done for you, what he's done for you. He did this, he did that, he did something else. Oh my goodness, he was so merciful to me under these conditions. I had a need and I looked up and there it was, Lord. I didn't do anything, there it is. Rejoicing is a, is, a, is a command, and we see by number here as we go down this list to find out something about rejoicing. Rejoicing is our Christian duty. That means as a born-again Christian, it is your duty, it is my duty to rejoice, and rejoicing implies the following things. This is a command. It's a mental, an emotional response of gratitude toward God for all that he's done for us. Well, here's what this implies. It implies that we should rejoice. Yes, as born-again believers, we should rejoice. Maybe you will or maybe you won't. But we should be rejoicing. Well, I'll tell you what, Lord, when things pick up and get a little better, I'll, I'll start rejoicing again. But do you see what's going on in my life today? I just no way I can rejoice, Lord. We should rejoice. Secondly, not only we should, we can rejoice. No, Lord, I, I just don't think I can, I'm not up to it today. No, you can. You can and you should. It's a Christian duty. We can rejoice that we have such a Savior, a Savior who has provided for us in every aspect. In fact, we should rejoice in Him. That's what it says. Rejoice in Him. And the first, and, and first in the order of things that brings rejoicing, what, what is, what's the first thing in the order of things that would enable us to be able to rejoice? You see, people who are outside of Christ, people who are lost, people who need to be born again, people who need to trust Jesus Christ as their Savior, knowing that he died, he was buried and resurrected. We should rejoice, and the first in order of things that brings rejoicing is to know that we are in the Lord. That means we're positionally sanctified. You're rocking along in life. You're on your way to hell in the lake of fire. You have a you, you look up and you say, you know, there, I, I, there's got to be a God out there somewhere. And you realize that there must be a God out there somewhere. And God brings along someone to give you the gospel. And you say, wow, how about that? Yes, I'm going to believe. And God took you out of the out of the position of Adam, 
The Holy Spirit's responsibility is to take you out of Adam and place you in Christ, making you positionally sanctified, set apart unto God for eternity. So while we should and can, we're going to rejoice because, first of all, we know that we are in him. See, regenerate Christians will not find true happiness, and I hope you understand this by now, and unless you're a teenager, it's very possible you haven't figured this out yet, but regenerate Christians will not find true happiness. See, true happiness. Oh yeah, there's, a, there's happiness in a bottle of beer. There's a hot, did you see the news last night? There was, there was a, a news program whereby on Newsmax where they were interviewing people on the street. I believe it was in Los Angeles. And they, they, they were showing where these, these people on the street are burning everything down. And when you look and see the scum, the, the dirt, the filth, and all that kind of stuff, it's just, it, it's, an, it's an amazing thing. Well, let's tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to move from California. I'm moving to Arkansas. No, I'm going to move to Florida. No, I'm going to move to Texas. No, I think I'll go to Ohio. No, how about North Dakota? Well, let me see. Uh, not Washington, D.C. Um, how about Mississippi. No, you see, what happens is we'll not find true happiness in riches or pleasures or vanity or ambition or books or in the world in any form. But you see, true happiness, the happiness that God wants us to have, is found in fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. In fellowship with him. In fellowship. That means you have to be walking in the sphere of the Spirit. You have to be metabolizing doctrine. You have to be applying the word of God from the source of your new man or your new woman. So happiness is found in fellowship with the Lord Jesus and in the confident assurance. Now we are in him, but what about the number of people who believe that you can get out of him? You see, when you know that you're in him, you are in Christ, you're saved, you can rejoice. But about the time you sort of get to thinking here and saying, well, boy, Lord, I can't believe what I did last night. I can't believe what I'm about to do here. And you realize and think that you can lose your salvation. But when you become sure, confident, you have this, this unlimited hope this confident assurance of, of eternal life, now when you're in fellowship and you have confidence about your eternal life, let me tell you what, you can begin to be happy. You can begin to rejoice in all things. And remember what rejoicing is? It's a mental attitude and an emotional response for the gratitude for all that God has done for us. Well, let's take a look here. Two things that we need to consider at this point in time. Our friendship with Christ, and when I'm talking about our friendship with Christ, got to thinking about this. Is, is it just, uh, okay, I'm in the sphere of the Spirit. Uh, okay, I understand that. But you see, this is why we've indicated that as you, t as you take in the Word of God and you move from babyhood to adolescence, and now you have metabolize, you've taken in, you've learned, you have believed a sufficient amount of doctrine to apply that to the circumstance of life where you actually enter into spiritual maturity. You're no longer a babe, you're no longer an adolescent, but you are, you are now a spiritually mature believer. Now, this is where terminology comes in. Whether you, whether you like Bob Thiem's terminology or not, is, that's up to you. But I find it very helpful knowing that when I reach spiritual maturity, that there are three, three different status, statuses of spiritual maturity. 
And it has to do with capacity for blessing and capacity for suffering. So how do you distinguish these three areas, not of spiritual growth? You've already grown sufficiently. You have the doctrine. It's a matter of application now. And we find that as a, spirit, as a spiritually mature believer, you can go to the bank on this. You're going to suffer. And it's not always because you've done something wrong, but it's because somebody else has done something wrong, and you're suffering by association. And secondly, God wants you to gain capacity to suffer and capacity for blessing in this angelic conflict so God himself allows certain things. And how about Paul's thorn in the flesh? I keep bringing that up. Paul didn't want that. Paul didn't ask for it. But God said, Paul, you were out in the Arabian desert with my son for three years. <clears throat> and you've got this information. But he said, I want to show you uh, what's going to happen to you about this, all this suffering because of who and what you are and the message you have. So I'm going to prepare you for the greatest of all kinds of suffering when, I tur when Satan's turned loose on you. He said, I'm going to prepare you for this. So he gave Paul a thorn in the flesh, and that thorn in the flesh was a demon that was sent to mess with Paul. Paul had to overcome that. You and I are going to have to overcome these same kind of same kind of tests, these same kind of trials. But you need to know that when you reach spiritual maturity, you reach spiritual self-esteem, you what we've indicated, that when you reach spiritual self-esteem, now you have a personal love for God the Father. You have enough information now to love Him no matter what the circumstance of your life is. So when we're talking about fellowship with God, fellowship with Christ, we're talking about a phileo love. This is why you need to have an understanding of the difference between agape love and phileo love. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. No, that word love there is not throw, your, throw his arms around you, hug you, tell you five nice things about yourself. That love means I'm going to put up with you. I'll put up with you no matter what you do. I'm still going to be me. I'm still going to be fair with you. I'm still going to treat you the way I should treat you. But look at you. Your life is rotten. It's, it's a stench in the nostrils of God. That's agape love. For God so loved the world. But when you reach spiritual maturity, you've got enough doctrine, you've got enough application, you've got enough growth, spiritual growth, to have a phileo love. It's a friendship love. Jesus has a friendship love for you. Why? You're on his side. Not You're not on his side simply because you're saved. You're on his side because you have grown to spiritual maturity and you have the capacity now to stay in fellowship 24 hours a day. Will you? That's up to you. Will I? That's up to me. But this friendship with Christ, that means you have a phileo love for him and you have a, uh, and he has a phileo love for you. Now, I'm telling you, I've seen, I've heard, I've listened to people who are born-again Christians and find themselves in a situation where they're under pressure and they're doing exactly like the Jews did on 14 occasions in the Old Testament. They bellyache, they gripe, they moan, they groaned, they marabod. That's not phileo love for Christ. See, you have to get to the point where you are mature enough. You have enough doctrine, enough strength, to make an application of doctrine to the circumstance where, in fact, you can still have a phileo love for Jesus Christ. Well, I'll tell you what, Jesus, do you see what's going on in my life now? Huh. I'm not sure whether I'm, I'm going to be your friend or not. No, it's a 24-hour a deal. 24-hour a day. Loving, for, loving one another. So that idea of friendship... True happiness is found in fellowship with Jesus Christ. So let's move on here. Our friendship with Christ, that's our phileo love for one another, his love for us and our love for him. And secondly, our friendship with Christ and our function in service for him. That's your spiritual gift. Which one of the ten spiritual gifts do you have? 
How are you using that spiritual gift? See, this is one of the things that, that I find that in a religious kind of a setting, yeah, there are things that are true, but, you know, yeah, I've got a spiritual gift, but um, not sure what, not sure how it works, not sure what it means, not sure how to apply it. But you see, our friendship with Christ and our function in service for him should be our greatest joy. There is no greater joy in my life, please understand. There is no greater joy in my life than being in fellowship with God and serving him as a pastor teacher. And you know and I know with the gift of pastor teacher comes many problems. Many, many pressures. But the truth of the matter is if you have the gift of helps, if you have the gift of exhortation, if you have the gift of teaching, if you have the gift of giving, what is your spiritual gift? But our friendship with Christ and our function and service with him should be our greatest joy. And his friendship and our service for him, there is a true happiness, a true happiness. When you're serving him, when you're in fellowship with him, he is your friend. You, he is your friend and you are his friend. You're serving him. There is true happiness. So what do we do? With this true happiness that I found, in fellowship, in service for him, what are we going to do? Therefore, rejoice. See, our mental attitude and our emotional response of gratitude for God's abundance, great, abundant grace brings true happiness. You see, it's our privilege. Not so, well, you know, if it weren't for if if it weren't for Siri, I'd have to carry a a basket full of books. Possibly you understand that. I I don't consider myself as being deficient in uh, in vocabulary, words in the English language. But as I'm reading, do I read? In my reading, I see that the way people write, and I say, "What is what is they? What's this word? What does this word mean?" And so I ask Siri, Siri, what is the meaning of this word? When I look at it, I read it. I'll tell you, that's pretty handy rather than having to carry books around with you all the time. So it's our, he says, it's our privilege. I say, okay, what does it mean to, to have a privilege? What is our privilege? What does that mean? Well, the word privilege means, privilege means advantage. It means a right. It means a benefit. So actually, it is our privilege. It's our advantage as born-again Christians. See, People who are lost, false Christians don't have the advantage. They don't have the right. They don't have the benefit. It is your privilege, it is my privilege as a regenerate Christian to rejoice in all things. It's our privilege. We have an advantage that others don't have. The Muslims don't have this, the Shintos, the Confucianists unsaved people who are religious Christians on their way to hell, they don't have this advantage. They don't have this right. They don't have this benefit. It's your benefit. It's my benefit. It's our privilege to rejoice in all things. Father, I'm grateful for this mental attitude and this emotional response that you've granted to me that I can praise you and glorify you in everything I say and do. You see, since Christians have more resources, sources, since Christ has more sources, and that's the issue, Christ has more sources of joy than any human being. Now stop and think about this. Our goal, your goal, and my goal in the Christian life is to reach spiritual maturity. And in order to reach spiritual maturity, 
God's plan is for you, me, I, us, they, them, whoever they are as born-again Christians, regenerate Christians. It's God's plan for us to be transformed into the likeness of Jesus Christ. And that means you're going to think like Jesus, feel like Jesus, speak like Jesus, and do as he would do or did. That's the transformed life. That's not imitation. This is a transformation where he, he is living his life through you. So when we, when we understand that there are more sources of joy in Jesus Christ than in any human being, any other human being, I'm not here to be like my mother. I'm not here to be like my father. I'm not here to be like my wife. I'm not here to be like my children. I'm not here to be like my boss. I'm not here to be like Billy Graham. I'm not here to be like whoever. I'm here to be like Jesus. Because when you look at anybody else, there is no one in the world that has ever or will ever have more sources of joy than any human being. And his sources of joy never fail. The sources of joy of Jesus never fail. When we are living the transformed life, we have access to those sources of joy. So when, you're, when your life is going in all kinds of directions because of the pressure on you because you're a born-again Christian, you can still have that joy because there are more sources of joy in Jesus Christ and his joy, his joy, never, his joy never fails. So when we're living that transformed life, and this is why we need to focus on the goal line, and the goal line is spiritual maturity. It's not out there doing this, doing that, doing something else. It's being transformed into the likeness of Christ. Now, look at the diagrams that I've placed on the, on the screen here. I created these diagrams so that you could un we might give us some help in, in, in seeing what it means to grow spiritually. Well, this first line that I have up here, I've got this clock. And the, the idea came to me, if we're, going to do, if we're going to grow spiritually, you've got to start somewhere. And so the idea of capturing the image of a clock might help to describe and show us what it means to grow spiritually. To get a glimpse of it. So, each one of these six squares here that have a clock in it, each having the numbers 12, 1, all the way back to 12, just like a clock, I put, I put, a, I put two lines in that clock. Starting at 12 o'clock, in each of these clocks on that top line, when the minute hand moves from 12 to 1, that's grown one twelfth of the way to get to spiritual maturity. In clock number 2, moving left to right, the minute hand is moved to 2. Then it moves to three, three-twelfths of the way. Then it moves to number four. See, this is advancement, and this is a, an illustration of advancing spiritually in the Christian way of life. Not just coming to Bible class. It's taking in the Word of God. So wherever you, wherever you are getting your information, if that pastor is not capable of taking you to one, to two, to three, to four, to five, to six. And that pastor is going to do that by giving you the information that you can metabolize in order to have it available for the circumstances of life to apply it 
to those circumstances so that you might grow spiritually. Spiritual growth is not determined simply by how much doctrine you have. It's how much doctrine are you applying from the sphere of the Spirit. So each one of these six clocks have a green square around it, indicating this is the sphere of the Spirit, and indicates that you cannot advance spiritually from one to two to three to four to five to six or to twelve unless you're in that sphere. So let's take those six, six uh, clocks, and I've created five rows here of information to explain those six clocks. Row number one. I'll highlight it. There. Row number one. Clock number one, moving from left to right, on row one, indicates you have advanced spiritually one twelfth of the way to spiritual maturity. Clock number two says you've, 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 you've advanced to two twelfths. Then it's three twelfths. Then it's four twelfths, then it's five twelfths, then it's halfway at six. Let's move on to second to row two. What does one what does number row number one represent? Row number one represents the intake and application of pertinent doctrine from the sphere of the spirit. Look at that row. Row number one represents the intake of application. That's one thing. Okay, you're coming to Bible class. That's fine. What are you going to do now that you're here? You need to intake that. That means you need to listen, metabolize that information down into the, into the human spirit where the Holy Spirit's going to teach you. Gnosis information becomes pneumaticus. Holy Spirit sends it back up into your left lobe. You now, you now know the information that God wants you to know. The question is, are you going to believe it or not? And when you believe it, it goes into the right lobe as vocabulary, doctrine, part of, uh, makes part of your, con uh, your conscience. Now the, uh, the circumstance comes along when you apply. Guess what? You move from 12 to 1. You have a new circumstance, more circumstances. And in God's time, in God's plan, His schedule, you move from, you move from 12 to 2. Then you get more circumstances, more doctrine, more application, you move to three. Then you get more, more doctrine, more application, and you move to four. You get more doctrine, more application, you move to five. You get more doctrine, more application, you move to six. This is growth. So row number one represents the intake and application of pertinent doctrine from the sphere of the Spirit. How about row number three? In row number three, this indicates each advance from 12, 1 to 12, 6 in this row, each advance represents the amount of spiritual growth, how much growth you've, ma you've made. It's 1 12th, 2 12th. And by the way, this is an illustration. God, you're not going to hear some voice from, from the heavens and say, uh, how far have you grown right now, Jim? They say, well, let me think, Lord, uh, right now I'm about uh, three-twelfths of the way. And uh, he says, excuse me, I don't understand three-twelfths. Well, I do understand, but uh, what, uh, uh, can you tell me something else about it? Well, okay, Lord, okay. It's one-fourth of the way, Lord, it's one-fourth of the way. You get to six, well, yeah, I'm, I'm halfway there, Lord. No, this is just an illustration of the, the idea of application and the, the spiritual growth that takes place in your life and the, the spiritual growth that is required for you to be able to rejoice always in all things. So row number three indicates each advance representing the amount of spiritual growth that you've, that you've had up to this point in time since you've been saved. Row number four. Number... Row number four tells you how far you're going, how far you have to go. Row three tells you how far you've gone. Row four tells you how far you've got to go. Each one of these clocks, left or right, you've got eleven twelfths of the way to go. You're not grown very much. 
you're now your clock number two. You're ten twelfths of the way. You're five sixths of the way. You you you're making you're making progress. Then you get nine twelfths. You you're, you got nine twelfths to go. That's three fourths of the way to go. You're making you're making uh, making progress. Then it's eight twelfths of the way. Then it's seven twelfths of the way. Then it's six twelfths of the way. Halfway there. Say each one, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. That means you're, you're reducing the amount of time or uh, the, amount of, uh, uh, the amount of growth that's still a requirement. Row number five about these six, uh, six uh, uh, clocks. Row number four represents how far you need to go to reach spiritual maturity. And the remainder of the way, how are you going to get there? You're going to get for, in clock number six on the right hand side there, you're halfway to you're halfway to spiritual maturity. How are you going to get from seven to twelve? The same way you got from one to six. Take in the word of God, apply the word of God from the sphere of the spirit. So here's the here's the last six clocks: twelve seven, twelve eight, twelve nine, twelve ten, twelve eleven, twelve twelve. That's row six. Look at row seven. Asking yourself the question, what does row six mean? Row six represents increased intake and application of pertinent doctrine from the sphere of the spirit. The same thing as row two when you were just getting, uh, just getting, uh, getting started. But you're continuing the same process, taking in the word of God, applying the word of God, pertinent doctrine from the sphere of the spirit. Well, what about row eight? Row 8, each advance from 12.7 to 12.12 represents the amount of continued growth spiritually, that is, how much you've grown. So what we're doing in all 12 of these clocks is you move from 1 to 12. What you're doing is you're seeing how you are advancing. You're actually advancing, and you now know, and you should have known before this. This is just an illustration. It shows you what you have to do in order to get there. This is why, again, the millions of Christians sitting in, in a local assembly someplace where the preacher is still in the Old Testament, the preacher is still in, the, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, still focusing on Acts chapter 2, Pentecost 30 AD, spending time in the book of Revelation, When a pastor, a pastor that I'm aware of, that's a, a prominent teacher of the Word of God, something that I've wrestled with, that the, the entire book of Revelation does not focus on, on born-again Christians. It doesn't focus on Christianity, including the first three chapters. But let's move on from here. Row 8 represents the advance from 7 to 12, the amount of growth. Row number 9. Row number 9 says 5 to 12, 4 to 12, 3 to 12, 2 to 12, 1 to 12. Hey, you finally arrived. Well, what is row 9? Row 9 represents how far you need to go to reach spiritual maturity. In clock number 7, you've got five more, you've got five more spaces to go. Then you got four. Then you got three. And when you get to, to clock number six on the right-hand side, you finally arrived at spiritual maturity. And how do you get there? You take in the Word of God. It's consistently. And this is why when, when Sir Darrell, when he was teaching um, recently, he's done this on two occasions that I know of, where he was talking about Jesus being out in the, in the Arabian, in desert for three years and Sir Darrell broke that time down how much time you have to eat how much time you have to sleep how much exercise you have to do how much you how much time you spend in the bathroom those times when you are really not learning the word of God but what about all those other hours of the day well I'm spending them out there and uh, where are we I'm, uh, listen, I, I, I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm not going to mention any place where you might be 
because that's going to result that's going to result in you coming back to me and saying you were picking on me weren't you you were just just waiting for the time to criticize me because of what i do no i'm not going to do that i'm not going to criticize anybody what i'm asking for is for us to give attention jim bertell give attention to the minutes of the day that you have breath how are you spending those days you say well i got to have some fun somewhere along the line well jesus went into the jesus went off into uh, uh some areas where he went to get away from people and he went away to pray he went away to talk to his heavenly father and what i'm indicating to you is i've discovered in my own life the number of things that were distractions in my life. Boy, and it was going to, but I'll tell you what, it was going to give me prominence. Whoo, glory. I've got this church out there. It's got a thousand seats in it, and it's always filled. People stand in line waiting to get in the door. Oh, my goodness, the offering's going, it's offering, it, the offering's overflowing the plate. Oh, yes. Other pastors don't have that benefit. Then it's something else. You know, you go fishing, you caught a 10-pound fish of some sort. Good grief. What is it about life? Oh, couldn't wait to get a fifth-degree black belt. Only got to two. And guess what? God shut that down. Well, I had opportunities to witness and still have opportunities to witness to people I met there. But there's no, there's no, no big deal about telling somebody you're a second-degree black belt. Tell them that they run away. They think you're going to whip on them. That's not it. How far do you have to go? See, these clocks are showing us what, what growth is all about. So let's go to row 10. Row 10 shows row 9 representing how far you need to go to spiritual maturity. And row 11, row 11 is when you reach spiritual maturity, you've gone all the way around the clock. So when you reach 12-12, when you reach spiritual maturity, the following, the following things are true. When you reach 12-12 in this illustration, you've reached spiritual maturity. Now what happens, you're going to continue to suffer, to be blessed. You're going to increase your capacity for blessing. You're going to increase your capacity for suffering. Why? Because you're serving Jesus Christ and you are the target. I'm not sure where that's coming up in this lesson or somewhere somewhere near future. We're talking about Jesus was the Jesus was the talk was the target of Satan until he was seated at the right hand of God the Father. But when he sat down, you are a born again Christian, you now are the target. So let's go on for here for just for just a moment. What are you going to do? It says when you reach spiritual maturity, your life is totally transformed into the likeness of Christ's humanity. Listen to what I just said. I want you to believe that. I want the Spirit of God to illuminate your mind at this point in time. Well, teach you. I want him to teach you, and you have to believe it. When you believe it, you illuminate your own mind. When you have been transformed into the likeness of Christ's humanity, all circumstances you think like Christ thinks. When you reach spiritual maturity, in all circumstances, you speak like Jesus would speak. In all circumstances, you feel, you emote like Christ emotes. When you reach spiritual maturity, in every circumstance, you do like Christ did or like Christ would do. You see, you will consistently rejoice in all things. Let me go back here for just a minute. I started to talk about something that Daryl said. And I started that and then got distracted and went someplace else. I want to come back to it for just a moment. And it has to, it has to, to do with the fact that that when you go up here and look at this clock, going from the first the first clock 
on this line right here, the first line, in clock number one, you've got to go all the way around to 12. And you don't get from 12 midnight to 12 noon. You don't get there in 12 hours. And this is what Sir Darrell was trying to tell us. And I'm sure you heard that. I'm sure you liked it. I'm sure you understood it. But we have to put this into practice. Because getting from 12-12 to 12-12, 12 midnight to 12 noon, spiritually, is more than a 12-hour event. And Sir Darrell was showing us that if you just gave so many, uh, you, only went to, you, you only went to assemble for a Bible doctrine one time a month, then one time a week, then you, that kind of thing, how long it would take you to get to spiritual maturity. The number of hours that Paul spent with Jesus outside the bathroom, outside the, outside the kitchen, outside taking a walk, outside doing something else, how many hours in three years Paul would spend in studying what Jesus had taught him and what he was going to teach him. Now, when you, when you see that and you realize you're only, going to, you're only going to assemble one time a week, how about two times a week? Sunday school class and the morning worship hour. How about add Wednesday night? Well, the more time you add, the less time it takes you to get to maturity. But if there's not a consistent intake of the Word of God on a daily basis, if possible, we're diminishing the time that it takes to get to spiritual maturity. Where we can love God and He can love us. We love Him and He loves us. When we can, when we can continually consistently rejoice. Glorify God. So these diagrams are simply here to help us to understand how to do that. And I have a note here. I want to define true Christianity. I want to define true Christianity. See, there's the true Jew and the false Jew. There is the genetic Jew and the true Jew. There is no such a thing as a genetic Christian. But there are false Christians who are, who are people who claim to be Christian but have never been saved by the gospel of Paul. It's either some figment of some person's imagination of what it needs to be saved to go to heaven or it's what somebody has taught you, which generally is faith plus works, only to find out when you get to hell that that wasn't it. What's it take? What is a true Christian? By true Christianity, I am referring to, referring to God's plan for the human race that begins with spiritual salvation. True Christianity refers to God's plan, not somebody else's plan, not the Baptist plan, not the Methodist plan, not the Episcopalian plan, not some Muslim or Shinto plan. It's God's plan for salvation. It's how do I become this true Christian? See, millions of people claim to be Christians who have never been saved because they believe in a faith plus works form of salvation, and these people are not true Christians. So when you use the word Christian, you throw that word Christian out there. Say, oh, okay, you know, you, I see that church down the that building down there that says uh, what denomination is. Yeah, they're 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 Christians, really. So we want to make a distinction between someone who claims to be a Christian that's not a Christian and true Christianity. True Christianity, listen please. Oh my goodness. True Christianity is not sadness or depression. It's amazing. 
you turn on the news, you turn on a conservative news media, and within the first two or three days, you're going to see somebody on there who's a doctor, who's telling you how depressed American people are. How depressed our youth is. How many young people are contemplating suicide? Even last night, there was a recommendation that you, as parents, not the government, federal or state, telling you how long your child can use the cell phone, can use the iPhone, but parents teaching their children how to grow up, how to live their Christian way of life. And we're learning the amount of depression that is related to using the iPhone. I, it's amazing to me. I have never been on TikTok. I didn't like it from the time I saw what people were putting on this thing called TikTok, only to find out that TikTok is managed by the Chinese and the influence that this is having, social media, is having on your children. Depressed, worried, confused, don't understand anything about life, so much so that they're contemplating suicide. More about that later. True Christianity is not sadness. It's not depression. Question, how much sadness do you have? Are you depressed? True Christianity is full of rejoicing. Rejoice always. This is why reaching spiritual maturity is so important in our life. Because it gives us the capacity to rejoice in every situation of life. Let me go back here for just a moment. Let me go back to these clocks. Top row, 12 to 1, that's, that's how much growth you have. From 1 to 12, from, for, in other words, uh, you're starting out, let's start out at 12 midnight. 12 in the first clock, you've, you've advanced from 12 to 1 a.m., what that means is you've got to go from, from 1 a.m. to 12 noon, which is 11, 11 more jumps of, of spiritual growth there. And what that means is and the, amount of, the amount of space that you have to go to get to that number 12 in the 12th circle down here, the, number of, the, the amount of space that you have to go indicates the amount of growth that you need in your Christian way of life. And when you see how much growth you have to go, what you're doing is functioning there on human viewpoint. And there's no capacity, no capacity to rejoice in all things, rejoice continuously. So again, what I'm indicating here is that it, when you begin to see what I've got in these clocks here, until you reach 1212 12 in that last, last clock, there is a deficiency in your life that could cause you problems in your moment-by-moment -moment Christian life. That's why it's essential that we get to spiritual maturity as quickly as possible. And that's why when we come back, come back here, True Christianity, for example. True Christianity is not sadness. It's not depression. True Christianity is full of rejoicing, and we should never, 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 ever leave the impression that Christian way of life makes us gloomy or bad-tempered. Stop right there, please. This is one of the problems in Christian way of life. even though someone may be a true Christian, with no doctrine, they are denominational-focused individual with little to no spiritual growth. So that here's this person who is the true Christian, no spiritual growth, is a 100% is a, a fo focused, denominational person out there preaching the gospel, a true gospel, 
And the person they're preaching to knows the lifestyle of the person who's preaching the gospel. And the person who's hearing the gospel preached by the person who's the true Christian looks at that person and says, I don't want what you have because it has made no difference in your life. Hmm. So true Christianity is not sadness or depression. So I'm asking yourself, asking you, I'm asking myself, how much sadness do I display over the circumstances of my life? How much depression am I, am I um, manifesting in my Christian life? I can tell you right now, I can tell you right now, I'm speaking for myself. 100% none. 100% none. No sadness. No depression. I've given that up as a lost cause. So no matter what circumstance comes, I'm going to rejoice. I'm not going to be sad. I'm not going to be droopy-eyed. I'm not going to be depressed. I'm going to be on top of it. On, on top of it. I know that God has this situation in his hand. He's got it under control. So true Christianity doesn't have any of that. What it is is full of rejoicing. And we should never, and that means no matter what the circumstance of life, true Christianity is full of rejoicing. That's your mental, see, and it's a mental attitude. It's not standing up and hallelujah, praise God, Jesus saves. No, it's this mental attitude of peace. It's the mental attitude of joy. It's gratitude for all that God has done for us. But you see, I can't remember what he'd done for us. That's what many would say. So we don't want to leave the impression that life makes us gloomy or bad-tempered. And that's exactly what we do. When we do what? When we merit ball, when we bellyache, when we gripe, when we worry about even the little pressures of life. Full of rejoicing. This is rejoicing in every form of circumstance. You see, there are two things that regenerate Christians, that's, that's us. There are two things that we must do if we're going to obey this command to rejoice. We need to maintain consistent fellowship with God from salvation to death or the rapture. Okay, so you failed in the past. Get back in fellowship with God. Confess your known sins. Use Operation Cry, No Reckon, Reckon, and Yield, which is the missing link between being out of fellowship and being get, getting back in fellowship. Rebound alone does not put you back in fellowship with God. Listen, you can, you can bang on me, you can call me a liar, you can do whatever else. Time, if you have enough left, will show you that Operation Cry is the missing link to fellowship with God once you're out of fellowship. And until you are, until we learn that, and until it is learned, you stay out of fellowship with God until the day you die. What kind of event is that going to call for at the Bema Seat? So here's something we need to do. We need to maintain consistent fellowship with God from salvation to death or the rapture. That means we need to avoid mental, verbal, and overt personal sins. Mental t sins is what you think. Verbal is what you say. Overt is what you do. Secondly, beside maintaining consistent fellowship, we need to look for the bright spots in our Christian life. For some, there may be none. There may be none. But when you learn to get in fellowship with God, walk in the sphere of the Spirit, metabolize doctrine, apply doctrine, pertinent doctrine to the circumstances of life, guess what? you begin to have bright spots. Specific occasions when you trusted God and he provided. Now, don't lose sight of the mercies. Listen to me, please. Don't lose sight of the mercies. Oh, it's 1014. Let me finish this point. We'll come back Wednesday. Do not lose sight of the mercies. Oh, my goodness. What are, what are the mercies, Lord? I have to see. What does the word mercy mean? Where are, have you, have you ever been merciful toward 
toward me, Father? Say, look, don't lose sight of the mercies you have already received, and there are always enough mercies for which you can be thankful. Here are some examples of God's mercies for you and me. First of all, crediting you, crediting me with righteousness apart from works. At the moment of salvation, you believe that Jesus died, buried, and was resurrected, and immediately God credits you, he imputes absolute righteousness to you. Now, positionally, you're as good as God is good. Boy, that's something to, to rejoice about. How about offering us justification, righteousness, and redemption? Jesus Christ purchased our life. He purchased our salvation for us. That's a mercy. He didn't ask you to do anything. Faith is non-meritorious. He provided atonement. And that means the state of being reconciled to God. You are reconciled to God. You can't ever be unreconciled to God. How about this mercy? Taking judgment on himself. He didn't say, get on this cross. Well, he did put you on the cross retroactively. He put you on the cross. God put you on the cross with him, but you weren't there to feel that pain. He just put you there to show you that your old man, your old woman is dead. You can now live without sin. Without sinning, I should say. You'll always have the old sin nature till you die but taking judgment on himself. How about this mercy? For being forbearing and patient with us. When God looked down at me, he probably should have banged me in the head and knocked me for a loop. He said, get out of here. I don't want you anymore. But that's changed. Forbearing, he's forbearing and patient. He didn't do all that. He's patient with us. Forgiving our transgressions and covering our sins. Many people don't believe that. They confess it and pick it up and take it on with them. No, no, give it to him. Not counting our sins against us. Giving spiritual life to the spiritual dead. You were spiritually dead the moment you believed. He gave you spiritual life. See, the mercy of God is reflected in the cross of Jesus Christ. A direct reflection of his love for us. Well, we're out of time. Thank you for staying with me for two extra minutes. I'm going to close right here in prayer. And I'll see you this coming, uh, this coming um, Wednesday online, just like we're here. Father, goodness gracious. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your mercies, for your abundance of grace. And because of that, Father, I'm going to have a mental attitude, an emotional response of total gratitude. Gratitude for you because of all the abundance of grace that you show me. And I pray this for other folks, Father, but it's something we have to do ourselves. It's a volitional choice from ourselves. And I pray this in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. God bless all of you and good day. See you come again this coming Wednesday.